Hello, welcome to Prethought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Freethought Matters. Today, our guest is the Peabody Award-winning filmmaker of a documentary about the dramatic story of how a mother in Champaign, Illinois, took and won a landmark ruling ensuring our public schools are free from divisive religious indoctrination. We'll be right back to introduce filmmaker Jay Rosenstein. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. Our guest today is three time Emmy winning independent documentary producer, director, writer, and editor. J. Rosenstein. His work has been seen nationally on the PBS series POV and Independent Lens, the ABC World News, ESPN, and at Sundance Film Festival. His documentaries include In Whose Honor? American Indian Mascots in Sports, which aired nationally on PBS, and the Lord is not on trial here today, which is today's topic. That documentary, The Lord is Not on Trial Today, won a Peabody and an Emmy, and it tells the story of the case that established the separation of church and state in our public schools. It's called the McCollum versus Board of Education lawsuit. It's landmark. It was issued by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1948. The documentary also won a Silver Gavel Award as the best TV program for fostering the public's understanding of the law from the American Bar Association. And we'll be airing clips from the documentary, and we're so glad that its creator, filmmaker Jane Rosenstein, is here today. Uh, so thank you so much, Jay, for joining us. Uh, you're welcome. It's been a, a dream of mine to be on your show. So we've seen this amazing film you made. In fact, we've talked to some of the people in it. But tell us, how did you first get involved in making a documentary about this landmark Supreme Court case? Well, the way I got involved is actually our local newspaper uh, started reissuing some famous front pages from history. And one of the ones they reissued was the front page when Vashti McCollum won this case at the Supreme Court. And I had heard rumors that there had been some sort of case like that, but I, I didn't really know much about it. And it was when I saw that uh, front page headline that I finally uh, had an idea of what that was, and then I decided to start looking into the story. This was a case that was in, involved in Champaign, Illinois, and that's where you've been a professor, correct? That's right. Yeah, the case was born here. So, so had you known about the case before that front page story, or was that all news to you? Mostly was news to me. I had heard rumors over the years that Dan McCollum, who um, had been uh, the mayor of Champaign, Illinois, and basically everyone knows who he is, I'd heard a rumor that there had been some sort of, uh, you know, Supreme Court or legal case that involved him, but I didn't know anything more about it. So uh, before we show a clip from your documentary where uh, the heroine, Vashti McCollum and her son Jim describe the incident in school that becomes kind of the last straw for, for them. Can you briefly describe what, what the issue was about, what the school was doing? 
Sure. Uh, what the school had uh, begun to do is adopt a program uh, that was known as release time religious education, which was something that was actually occurring throughout the country. And uh, basically what that meant is that uh, a religious teacher was going to come into the school and give a religion class, but the religion class was voluntary, so not everyone had to take the class. Um, and so they began that program, and then when uh, Jim uh, hit fourth or fifth grade, it finally sort of caught up to him. In the fall of 1944, because his old school was overcrowded, Jim McCollum moved to a new school, the Dr. Howard Elementary School. He became the only one in his fifth grade classroom not taking the voluntary religion class. Teacher said the grades that had 100% attendance, and this was a public school teacher, would get a star on the door. Well, there was one classroom that didn't have a star. That was Jim's classroom because he didn't take the class. You see, the religious teacher moved right into their classroom. Anyone that wasn't taking the class had to get out. They had them sitting in the principal's office sometimes. Well, they had to have some place to put me. And they had a desk out in the hall that they usually put kids that were troublesome. And so that's where they parked me. When mom heard about it, uh, uh, things got a little testy. It was when they put them in the hall. And that's usually assumed you're there for punishment. That he came home in tears. That wasn't like Jim. He said never again would he go to school on the day's religious education. He just would stay home. I made up my mind, never again would he be put in the hall. That was that, no more religious education. We'd had it. So this was in the 1940s, and this is the film, The Lord Was Not on Trial, here today. Let's get right to the heart of the case. The, actually, the reason why you would take a case like this is the toll that this religious instruction situation was causing Jim and his family. Let's, uh, let's look at another clip uh, from the movie. Well, at Dr. Howard School in particular, it was pretty hostile. And I had several fights and hassles. I remember one time they chased me all the way home. He was beaten up more than once on the way home from school. He liked to go to Y after school and do some swimming. They took his shoes away from him. He walked home in the snow without his shoes. One classmate remembers things being even worse. I watched my classmate James McCollum being victimized repeatedly, remembers William Sholem in a letter sent years later to his brother. I saw him verbally abused and badly beaten in a school environment where bullying was otherwise absent. I cannot remember the exact epithets used against James, but memory of the place, the hate in my classmates' eyes and actions, and the tears are etched in my memory as if I was there today. Mrs. McCollum knew she had to do something to protect her oldest son. In the spring of 1945, she reached a decision that would forever change the lives of her and her family. She would sue the Champaign, Illinois Board of Education to try to put a stop to the religion classes. But she insisted that she, not Pappy, would file the lawsuit. I think Pappy felt the responsibility of a married man with three kids. He liked his job here, and he knew that there'd be repercussions. Pap never once said, don't do it. Never once. If Pappy said I shouldn't do it, I don't suppose I would have listened. With three boys to feed and the family living on Pappy's modest university professor's salary, Mrs. McCollum couldn't afford a lawyer. But she heard about a group of Chicago businessmen called the Chicago Action Council, who were concerned about religion being taught in the public schools. 
when they heard about it, they said, tell that little lady, go ahead, we'll pay the legal bills. On Monday, June 11, 1945, with her newly hired Chicago lawyer Landon Chapman at her side, Vashti McCollum filed her lawsuit to stop the teaching of religion in the Champaign Public Schools. I filed the case, and I said, Pappy, do you suppose they'll mention it in the newspaper? He said, oh, I'm sure they will. Came out a big splash in the newspaper. Pappy saw it, and he said, now you belong to the world. The backlash was immediate. A Chicago newspaper reported that people were shocked that Champaign has a family of atheists in its midst. In the state legislature, a member of the Illinois House of Representatives proposed a resolution asking the University of Illinois to fire anyone who was an atheist. But the resolution was withdrawn, only when it was learned that Mrs. McCollum was no longer a part-time square dancing teacher at the university. Around the McCollum house, things were suddenly different. I remember my mother talking to my brothers and me, saying that everybody in town knows who we are. And if we misbehave or did bad things, it would come back and uh, uh, recoil back upon the family. Not, not in an uh, admonishing way, but trying to explain to us how, how delicate our situation was. It was very disconcerting to realize that, hey, well, that's right, we are totally out there exposed. We are watching that fabulous Emmy and the Peabody award-winning documentary, The Lord is Not on Trial Here Today, uh, that is, um, was directed, produced, created by our guest, Jay Rosenstein. And we have to go to a break in a minute, but qu a quick question to you, Jay. How many years did you work on this fabulous documentary? Uh, well, I, I worked on it for about four years, but not full-time. So uh, I had a full-time job at the same time. So. I, I worked in sort of fits and starts. And... Well, it certainly shows. Um, and when we come back, we're, you're going to see the conclusion of what happens in this very dramatic case and how atheist families used to be treated in the 1940s. And uh, so we're watching Free Thought Matters. We'll be right back with Jay Rosenstein. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed, as you may be, by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Bill, and I'm an out-of-the-closet apatheist, meaning I don't really care what you believe, and I don't really think that you should care what I believe. I was raised in South Dakota in a strict Catholic family. I was an altar boy. I served Mass a lot of Sundays twice. We, the, the priest gave us this little card that said, in case of accident, please call a priest. I don't really like that idea anymore since I left the church about 40 years ago. Now, if you find me alongside the road after an accident, please call an ambulance and an EMT. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're talking with Jay Rosenstein about his powerful Peabody Award-winning documentary about a landmark Supreme Court case against religious instruction in the public schools. So thanks again, Jay, for being with us. My pleasure. So it must have been uh, difficult after all these decades to find people to interview. Uh, was that a hard thing to do, to put this documentary together? Yeah, actually, that was probably uh, one of the biggest challenges of all. Uh, as it turns out, 
um, of all the people who were principal in this case uh, and who were adults at the time, Vashti was the only one who was still alive uh, wow. at the time that I made the film. So the other people who appear uh, are people who were actually children at the time that the case uh, took place. Yeah, and you have to show the opposition through photographs and clips, but it was so wonderful that Vashti was still alive for you to meet and to film. Yeah, it was, it was lucky. And in fact, the way I found out that she was still alive was um, when I first heard about the story, I picked up the phone book. Uh, we're all old enough to remember when there was such a thing as a phone book. And uh, her name was in the phone book, and I just dialed the number, and she answered the phone, and that's how I knew she was still alive. We want to show the environment of religion in America in the 1940s. You have a little clip about the cultural viewpoints then. But these were the wartime years in America. World War II was in full swing. There was pressure on everyone in the country, young and old, to pull together for the good of the nation. Not going to church was seen as unpatriotic. We're on the cusp of a religious revival. God had been with the United States in the, the war against uh, Nazi atheism. Uh, the, there's a sense that uh, we should be grateful. Uh, the prosperity is tied in with patriotism and religion. Uh, and so we're on this cusp of um, moving religion into public life uh, ever more so. The biggest ceremony of its kind in post office history sees Secretary Dulles take part in the introduction of the first stamp with a religious message. As a memento of the occasion, there's a feeling that religion in the public square is a perfectly legitimate activity. And who could be against that unless you were a godless communist? Are you a member of the Communist Party? Are you now? Have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I have not refused to answer the question. I told you before I will answer this question now, fully. Lieberman, Your purpose Lieberman. is to use this to disrupt the motion picture industry. Now, to invade the right not Nobody else was going to admit that uh, they didn't go to church or were not religious. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It was a time of conformity. It had been a time of conformity and solidarity all through the war, and, and after the war, it was a, a time when people were very concerned about anything that seemed radical or uh, different. I think most people thought atheists were un-American, unpatriotic, uh, immoral, since in the America of that day, Morality stemmed from one source, and that was uh, a belief in God and religious commitment. So this is um, the, the film, The Lord Was Not on Trial, here today uh, by producer Jay Rosenstein. And in that clip we just saw, we saw one of the boys, Dan McCollum, growing up, that you got to interview, Jay. Uh, so there were trials. Tell us, what does the name of the documentary mean, The Lord Is Not on Trial, here today? Well, it comes from a story that uh, came from the trial, and Dan told me the story, and it's in the film, but apparently the first day of the trial, uh, a man sort of rushed in uh, from the audience and ran up to the, uh, the, the opposing counsel and said, I'm here to testify for the Lord. <laughs> and uh, the lawyer said in response, well, the Lord is not on trial here today. <laughs> so, so briefly, Vashti McCollum lost at the local and appeals level, but she kept appealing all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And you have a clip about that. An attorney over in Peoria, he called, asked me if I was going to the Supreme Court here in Washington. I said, oh, well, I can't afford it. He said, just you can. He said, we're going to go first class on the Capitol Limited. He paid my expenses. When I got to the Supreme Court, all the seats were filled. They've come so far, no place to sit. My friend's husband managed to make space for me down among the men, the lawyers, 
who had been admitted to the Supreme Court. And that's where I sat. But without the connivance of friends, I, I couldn't have even heard my case. The hearing began with Mrs. McCollum's lawyer, Walter Dodd, stating her case. The elderly man spoke slowly, and in a voice, according to one newspaper, so quiet you could barely hear it in the back row. Dodd was immediately hit with questions from the justices, according to a press report, in far greater numbers than are usually raised by the tribunal. It was really thrilling because I'd been to two other court hearings when everything was the other way. I hadn't really had a hearing in court. Now, for the first time with Walter Dad, I was having my day in court. The school board's attorney, John Franklin, was the complete opposite of Dodd. He waved a coin in front of the justices, saying they'd have to strike the words, in God we trust, if they ruled against him. Franklin was frequently interrupted by the justices and angered one when he claimed a ruling against him meant the justices were anti-religion. Veteran court observers were amazed at the way Franklin talked back to the justices. I think at that time, John Franklin knew that uh, this was not going to be the slam dunk that he'd, uh, he'd encountered in the, in the uh, circuit court or in the Illinois Supreme Court. The oral arguments ended with, as one newspaper reported, Franklin, the small town attorney, shaking his finger at the nation's highest court and declaring it could not strike down the American people's interest in religion. The court battle was finally over. So Jay, a wonderful documentary. Uh, and before we show the last clip, let's cut to the chase. What happened at the Supreme Court? What was the outcome? Oh, you want me to give away the ending? I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, ultimately, uh, she won after, again, losing at the circuit court uh, level and at the uh, state Supreme Court level. Uh, she actually won a resounding victory uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court. So you captured how um, Vashti and her son Jim, the principal kid involved, learned Vashti had won in this clip. As you know, the Supreme Court usually hands down rulings on a Monday. Every Monday I was pretty close to the telephone. On that particular Monday, I got the, the call. It was cloudy and cold on March 8, 1948, when the call finally came. For Vashti McCollum, three years of what she described as headlines, headaches, and hatred were about to reach their conclusion one way or another. We had a, one of these uh, phones, I've never seen one quite like it, that actually hung to the wall. My, how she hated that phone. But the uh, phone rang and she uh, picked it up and the reporter said she'd won and asked for a comment. And then there were some very nice pictures of her posing next to the phone. <laughs> It was a resounding eight-to-one decision. The religion classes had been ruled unconstitutional. It was the first ever violation of the Establishment Clause and the first time in American history that the Supreme Court prohibited a religious activity in a public school. It was the beginning of the separation of church and state in public schools. The Supreme Court rules eight-to-one uh, you're lucky if it was five to four, but eight to one of striking. I called my parents' home. Mother answered the phone. My son Jim was there. She told him, he threw up his hands. He said, I knew Mom was right. <laughs> Pappy was sick in bed that day. I opened the door. He said he knew as soon as I opened that door that I won. I have seen your documentary many times, Jay, but I still have a huge smile on my face every time we come to this, practically teary-eyed. This was 
truly a, a dramatic, she had lost at every level, and then for justice to prevail, for this family to prevail after all they've gone through is so thrilling. And now this case is kind of jeopardized. But uh, yeah. when you wrote, we only have about two minutes left. Any surprises for you as you worked on this film? Uh, several, and, and a couple of them were contained in that clip, or a, a couple of the clips we've shown. One in particular was, uh, which we saw in the clip before this last one, which, it, you know, it never occurred to me that uh, y you wouldn't go or you wouldn't have the opportunity to go hear the oral arguments for your own case. It never occurred to me that uh, Vashti actually didn't have enough money to be able to just go to Washington and hear her case. So I really love that whole story about um, how someone else who she didn't know bought her ticket and then the story about how she couldn't find a seat. Um, oh. You know, these are the, like interesting personal details, well, but things that you take for granted. Well, of course she would go, and of course there'd be a seat for her, but that, that wasn't yeah, the case. We had a case before the Supreme Court. We just filed in in line with everybody else. I'm not sure we would have been guaranteed. Mm. So that, yeah, the films don't show it that way. Uh, so it's a, such a satisfying endeavor for you. You must be very proud. Uh, I am, and like you, uh, I always get a big smile on my face when I hear them talk about the final result. Um, in particular, I, I really love that story that Dan tells about the, the phone. And every time I hear him say, my, how she hated that phone, uh, it always makes me laugh. So how can people see the whole film? Is it available somewhere? It is now going to be available through the Freedom for Religion Foundation. From, yes, from FFRF on our shop. And you also have something up on your website. In a, a half a minute left, working on anything new, Jay? Well, um, what I'm working on now is that I just retired from the <laughs> University of Illinois. So I'm working on the, uh, the transition into the next phase of my life. Well, um, thank you so much, Jay Rosenstein, for documenting this vital legal history. And not only that, how you bring it to life, how important thank it is you. for the public to see this. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you again. Good to see you. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.